Okay, uh, so just let me share my screen. Okay, so I hope you can see my screen. Okay, uh, so we will be today then uh, talking about the applications of artificial intelligence. And you know that AI nowadays, it becomes really uh, a buzzword, right? So it's a trend. Everyone is talking about the AI, where we can use AI, why AI is important. So is it really easy to use the AI? So, hey, I'm not from the computer science. So I'm from, let's say, other uh, colleges. So do you think I can use it where I can get the benefits? So today we will be covering uh, most of the topics. So. Um, here is the agenda. So I will be uh, starting with the history of AI, introduction to the AI, AI types and methodologies, application domains of AI, GBT and more AI tools, and finally the current challenges in AI and its future uh, perspectives. So if we need to think about the history of AI, and I think everyone will start thinking about I'm really wondering about when the AI has been really started and uh, who did think about the AI, how was the evolution of AI and, uh, and so on. Okay, so the, the beginning of the AI, you may be surprised if I, if I tell you that the AI, the, I would say the initial thoughts was in the Bronze Ages. And the Bronze Ages is long time back where the Greek, they were thinking about one giant animated bronze warrior called uh, Talos. And this one was basically programmed. And the goal of this one to guard the island of a Crete created by the, uh, the Hypsotus. Now, this Talos was honestly just an imagination. So they were really programmed some, uh, like some animated but they didn't know it will come a time that this kind of animation will come real and will come uh, really true. And after the bronze, uh, the bronze ages, we had another, again, a trial, which was 1950. And we can say 1950 was really a serious trial about uh, the AI. So one scientist called Alan uh, Turing uh, published an article and this article he was looking for the possibility of making the machine things. So 1950, he was thinking about that. So I have a machine, why I don't make the machine really to think uh, like a human? And Alan Turing even, he took um, advanced steps, okay? Uh, he tried to, um, uh, like, he tried to think about, okay, what, how I can know that if really the machine thinks or not. So he, he found, like, after he did some investigation, he found out that, okay, you know something? Uh, basically, when we do testing, we have a problem that how we can define thinking. So if I ask you a question, could you define thinking to me? How you can say this person is thinking or not? You may tell me, I just give him a problem. And if he solves the problem, it means really he, uh, I mean, uh, he thinks, okay, or she thinks. So after that, he found that, okay, you know, that's uh, maybe not, um, uh, I would say it's not a good 
uh, because it's not easy to define what does a mean thing. Then he revised his testing, Turing testing. And what he did, he said, if the machine can uh, be in a conversation and that conversation, no one can understand it or distinguish that in conversation because it's from machine, then they call this one uh, basically um, um, uh, like an AI or artificial intelligence. You know, it was at the beginning, you know, so that's why you don't need to think that, oh, you know, it seems not as smart what they were thinking about, but it was really very smart, okay? So it was, you have to know, it's not an, an easy to think at that time, I'm telling you 1950, that how I can really think about machines that they think. Now, after uh, 1950, we have in 1951, uh, game AI, uh, one guy, his name is Christopher. Christopher basically with his colleague, uh, his name uh, Prince, both of them, they were thinking about why we don't uh, program machines that they can play chess, okay? So uh, that's what they were uh, thinking about. And then uh, what happened, um, you may think that is, it was that much easy, it was not easy. So it was only, for example, uh, digitalized or how it looks like. I can show you, here are the machines. Just think about it, how the machines, that's just only to play the chess. And it was not like nowadays. Nowadays, if you play chess with a computer, you may lose, okay? You may not be able to uh, basically when or you will not be able, for example, to even compete with the, uh, with the chess or with the computers nowadays. But the 1951 was like that. So they try to think about how we can make the machines uh, play games, okay? So uh, yeah, that's about um, uh, 1951. Then the birth of AI where we can say is 1956. So if you need really to know the actual year when the, the AI was coined or when the AI was defined or when the AI was really uh, appears, it was in 1956, okay? So John um, McCarthy, which is, um, I mean, considered as the father of AI, so, he was uh, basically um, the first one who did coin uh, the term of artificial intelligence. He did it in uh, one conference, scientific conference. Uh, we will know and learn what uh, this one uh, was mean. I mean, how he defined it and what was the definition, okay? So uh, yeah, uh, that's about uh, basically the, um, uh, the birth of AI. I will just, just excuse me for a few seconds. I need to check the room here if we can connect it because we have students in here in this room. Just give me a second and I will be. Yeah, okay, thank you so much. So um, yeah, that's 1956. That's really the year where we have, um, I mean, the birth of AI. After that, we had the first AI lab, it was in 1959. So the people once this, uh, the father of AI, John McCarthy, he coined the term of AI, artificial intelligence, MIT, they were thinking about designing a lab. And they were really uh, came up with the first lab, okay, first AI lab, it was in 1959. And they were trying to do some research at that time. So the research on AI began in 19. 59 okay so after that 1960 it was the first robot so many of us when anyone talked about ai we start thinking about robot uh, robots or robotics or etc right so the first um robot was in 1960 okay and it was introduced to the general motor assembly and um, at that robot they call it an image an image and this animate was, um, uh, has a series like 1900, where after that they have a new series. Uh, they try to have even a new um, uh, forms and uh, et cetera. Okay, so yeah, again, I'm sorry, let me, I will disconnect just to see how we can connect it to the machine. We have students in here and we'll be back uh, with you.
Okay, so okay, I think it's okay. Sorry for that. Uh, I think now we are connecting to uh, to the screen here in the class. Okay, so um, so again here we were talking about the history of AI. So where we uh, we said it starts from 1950, and then 1951, uh, 56, then 1960. And 1960 basically was a general motor robot. It was um, a named by an email. And this robot basically was just um, a hand robot, basically. It's not a complete robot, okay? And has a series and that after that, they start to develop and improve uh, uh, that robot. Okay, so um, um, after that in 1961, we have the first AI chatbot. And that chatbot called 
Eliezer, and that was introduced in 1961, okay? And uh, this chatbot was um, basically at the beginning trying in terms of answering some questions based on some rules. So there are rules. So you ask a question that uh, chatbot and um, based on the, uh, um, uh, I mean, the rules that it has, they can answer you. So um, after that, we start to make more advances in AI. In 1997, IBM, they have Deep Blue. And the Deep Blue uh, beats the world champion uh, Kessel Probe on the game of chess. And that was really um, a good, uh, I would say, revolution that they have a game that can beat a uh, human. Okay, so that's really was advanced uh, and was uh, developed by the IBM. So after that, 2005, uh, there is a DARPA. Uh, by the way, DARPA, it's, um, in, uh, it's like an institution in USA. Uh, they do every year a challenge. And that challenge, worldwide, you can participate in that challenge. And they have a good amount for prizes for the first winner, second, and third. The goal of DARPA to really have something innovative, innovative uh, solutions and they can even give the first winner up to $1 million. So uh, Stanford uh, racing team uh, from Stanford University, they basically have an autonomous robotic car. So that car was the first car driving without a driver. And uh, they named that car Stanley. So Stanley wins the 2005 DARPA grant. Again, that's another achievement in AI. Okay. so. Um, Another also one 2011, again, IBM. I, honestly, IBM, one of the uh, really good industrial company that they do uh, uh, invent many things, okay? And they try always to invent something and they try to have really good, um, uh, I mean, good application. So they generated, again, kind of chatbot. They call it Watson. And that Watson was kind of answering machine. So you open that Watson, you can ask a question and they can answer you. And the good news about this Watson, it was really able to beat some of the programmer introducers, uh, big names like Brad Rutters and uh, also Ken uh, Jennings. So you can see then the evolution of AI, how it was fast and how they try really to, to beat the humans because the goal of AI at the end, we need really to make the machines think like a human and behave like a human. So in 2014, Alexa, I think everyone heard or maybe used Alexa. So Alexa was really um, uh, an interesting thing. So it's a, like a virtual assistant uh, where it can, you can ask for something and can reply you, it can do something it was invented by Amazon. So after 2014, uh, 2016 Tesla, so Tesla start um, having the autonomous cars, the uh, autonomous um, uh, uh, cars where they apply the AIs in there, okay? And it's not only AI, they apply many branches of the AI. And uh, Tesla, they did really, um, I would say some revolution in AI. So many, many of us, they didn't believe that we would ride a car that no one will drive that car, right? So nowadays we can see Tesla everywhere and everyone try uh, to have a Tesla, okay? Yes, it has some problems, that's fine, but at least uh, the performance, the things it shows that it, it did really good job, uh, better than the existing cars. Now, 2021, we had really some tools, I'm not sure, or some, Revolution, I'm not sure if you did hear about it, is AI generated NFTs. It's related to the art. So you have an AI, you talk to the AI, you give a text, and then the AI will generate an image from your text. That was really something amazing. So you just tell the AI, hey, AI, I have in my mind the car falling from the mountain. Then the AI will try to draw an art for you about that. So one of the examples, as you can see here, by using the uh, Dell A2 tool, you can find it online. I mean, it's uh, free. Um, one of the problems, one of the texts was a king uh, smiling spaghetti on his feet. Then we asked that one, okay, could you draw? And you can see the pictures there. And there are many different um, AI tools they can do 
different types of the art. And if you need it kind of um, um, re, uh, like I would say virtuality, like uh, metaverse, avatar, something, it can also show you uh, different pictures. Of course, 2022, uh, GBT, everyone now talks about GBT and GBT it makes really um, a new revolution, right? Everyone is thinking about it. Everyone thinks to use it. Students, they need to use it in their research. Uh, researchers, they need to use it in their domains. Even the business, they try to think about GBT to have it as a plugin. They reply to emails. They send email to customers, to the clients. So it's, it's really something I think it will reach to a good, um, a good place. And they are improving now the GBT and having more plugins. So one of the things that I just said, which is state of the art still, it's not available. They are trying now to uh, train the GBT on voices. So let's say they train the GBT on my voices and then they give the GTB a text and text will say that text on my voice. And that would be really something dangerous because of the authentication. When you talk to someone and there's someone who will believe it's you, then you may share with him some information or something which is very dangerous, okay? So um, now I would like to go to the second part which is introduction to the AI. So if we need really to think about the AI, we need first to think about the intelligence. So how we can define the intelligence or what is the intelligence, right? That's really very important. So the intelligence uh, it has been defined uh, over the time in many ways. And that's clear, why? Because the, the human, they are uh, evolved over the time. So now if I ask you, what does it mean intelligence to you? you can answer a question is different from 10 years ago, because now you can see the machines, you can see the new technologies. So that's really very difficult to have a specific definition of the intelligence. But here on this slide, there are some examples. So the intelligence, they define it, for example, you need to uh, think about, um, uh, for example, uh, how the human take the task and think about the task. Uh, also, we need to think about it, how the other even humans, they can take the task. So for example, we cannot say intelligence, it, it's just for human. Um, I think some researchers recently, they found there are some intelligence came from non-human, uh, mm -hmm. like animals or come from planets, okay? So now the question again, are we the only example of intelligence in the universe? I mean the humans, so the answer, of course, no. So there are other sources. Um, questions that are still uh, the people debate to understand it and to know, um, like uh, the philosophers, uh, uh, like the physiologists uh, and the scientists, everyone. So how the AI for? That's the question is still the people they are thinking about how we can test that one. So for a human, you can use IQ and then you say the IQ of this one is let's say that score, which means he's genius or he's not that much smart. But what about the robot? You cannot say the robot, hey, could you answer these questions of IQ? And based on your answer, I will say how smart you are or how intelligent you are, right? So uh, what is the nature of intelligence? How you can, in, like how you can ensure that intelligence, how you can be sure the environment or the nature that you do have is the best to have really that AI things, okay, to be uh, applied or to be implemented or even to test it or to do many, many other stuff. So um, one of the definitions, which is basically related to the human, uh, they were thinking about if I need to really to define intelligence in terms of a human, I'm thinking if the human can do abstraction, can do logic understanding, he can be self-awareness about the things, learning emotion and knowledge, reasoning, planning, etc. Now the goal, when you get learned, you will not repeat the action. What does it mean? It means that the knowledge that I have, the creativity, the thinking, it will help me to adapt my behavior. And that's the main problem with the machines. The machines, most of the time, they cannot be adapted. So when you train a machine for your data set or for your job, 
Later you will find, oh, I need to again retrain my machine for something else, okay? So again, the, the, at the end of this slide, so the capacity to acquire and apply knowledge, that's really the main, the main things. So we need the machine to get the knowledge and then apply that knowledge. And then we can see that that knowledge it helps to solve the problems or complicated problems. So um, defining intelligent different domains, uh, some of them, they were in, in neuroscience, some of them from the uh, physiology and some of them from uh, philosophy. So they are different. I mean, they are different scientists. Uh, they were trying to define the AI or I would say the intelligence. So they did say that it's really uh, the deeper capability where you can comprehend our surroundings, where you can find out what to do, that's the main thing. So if we look at our maybe kids or our little brothers uh, or little sisters, we try to teach them, don't do that. And we give them some knowledge why they don't need to do that. And then we can see them next time they don't do that. So it's like you train them, right? So that's how the machine it looks like. So we need a capability that once they have that knowledge, they can really think about something makes sense and something how I can do that, okay? So the problem with our machine is so far, if anything's happened where you didn't train the machine, maybe everything would be destroyed because of that, okay? And I'm not sure if you did uh, see the video where the Tesla autonomous car was, uh, the, uh, I mean, was uncontrolled and it was uh, driving speed, I mean, faster, and then many accidents happen because of that. So when it's something happened, we will lose the control and that's very dangerous. Now coming another one, so they were thinking, no, I need to think about some, you know, we are humans with different skills. So human A has a skills maybe stronger than B. Now the question, another, another definition of intelligence, how human B can be like a human A? So that one from the uh, physiology part uh, or point of view. So I see how he thinks, I adapt my thinking to think like him or her. So that's also intelligence. So another one also uh, for philosophy. So the intelligence is like a force. So, and that force, you can use it to maximize your future of freedom. Again, so there are many definitions. Now coming back to the father of AI, and he, as I said, his name, John McCarthy, was born in 1927 and passed away in 2011. He did say that it's a science of making intelligent uh, machines. That's the basic, and I would say it's really a good definition. Um, especially intelligent uh, computer programs. That's what he did define the AI. Now, um, again, as I said before that John McCarthy, he coined uh, the term AI. So that first time that the people heard about AI, artificial intelligence was in 1956 by uh, this guy. Now, we knew about the history, we knew about some definitions, but the, the question now, how I can use the AI? What are the types? What are the methodologies? Where we are? So what are the existing tools? If I have a research problems, I need really to use AI to solve my problems, how I can do that? And what are the methodologies? Now, before I go that, uh, one of the questions you need to ask yourself, if you design um, a machine to solve a problems in your research domain, how you can say this is really an intelligent machine or how you can measure the intelligence. Now with the humans, look at your friends. Sometimes when your friend uh, do some actions, you say you are really smart. How you did that? Oh, how you think about that, right? So here are, and if you look at the slide, there is a picture where it shows you how you can, for example, think about um, how they are smart. It could be how they teach. It could be how they behave, how they talk, how they act, how they behave. So there are many ways how you can say X is smart, X I think he's not that much smart. And we always hear from many of us that you judge others by if he's a smart, not a smart. How you judge, oh, you know, he did that behavior and that behavior was clearly it's not a smart action or a smart step from him or from her to do that, okay? Now with the machines, we need to think about the general definitions when it comes to our research. What we were talking about 
It was a very general one. Now, generally, artificial intelligence is the process you try to build in the intelligence system. But that intelligence system will be from vast volume of data. So generally, the AI, we use it when you have a large or big data of, uh, uh, of a data set, okay, in your domain. It could be healthcare, it could be computer science, it could be in uh, geography, linguistic, medicine. There are many uh, fields they deal with the big data. Now, how this artificial intelligence or how this machine from the previous data will really be smart or will be really think in good way, they will learn. So when you tell, for example, a machine, this picture is number one, and then you show another picture, this is number one, another picture is number one, then the machine will understand what the number one means and how it looks like. When you give a, a target, a testing uh, one, and ask the machine, hey, could you guess, is it one or no? Then it will look, oh, based on what I have been trained, oh no, this is not one. So based on the data you give to the machine, it will be intelligent because it will be learning from that one. Now the question, is it always we train the data? Well, I mean, we train the machines? Not always. We have supervised and we have unsupervised and we will be talking about, um, about them. So what is the benefits of that? You know, we are human. We, for example, if I ask you 10 times five, you will tell me 50. If I tell you, okay, let's make 15 times 233, you will say, okay, wait, let me think. But if you get more complicated, you will say, oh, do you think I'm a calculator or do you think I'm a machine to do that, right? Then you will not answer. So that's a clear, it will be really sweet and accuracy will be really accurate and the effectiveness will be really uh, very effect, uh, effective. Now, okay, you may say, but you are contradict with yourself. You are telling the AI, meaning machines make it as a human. And now you are telling us a human cannot do many tasks. That's completely true. But what I'm seeing making as a human, taking the decisions. So you train the machine, do this. But what if something happened was unseen, so, uh, circumstances happened, the machine will fail. How the machine will take that decision. So that's what we always try to do, okay? We need the machine really to be like a human in terms of taking decisions. But on the other hand, it will really escalate the capabilities to the unbelievable uh, rate. Okay, so um, the approach is generally what we do. Um, it might also, we need the machine to think like a human or act like a human or think with rational or acting with a reasoning, okay? So the first one thinking like human, you need to understand uh, the problem and then model a solution for that problem, that's all. So there's a problem, we understand the problem, we make our system model to solve that problem. So if that problem changed, something happened, you need to revisit your model. Now the other one, you need to act. It's not only to think about solution. Now acting when, uh, for example, something happened, you train the machine to do some actions for that. So if you find a problem, you find a solution, you model your system, and then your system was thinking like human, but now I need a system to act against that uh, issues. The best or what we always think about is reasoning. How we make the machine to really reason about the action or activities. You know, many times you talk to someone, do that. And then when he does for you and something happened that, oh my God, why you did that? Are you dealing like a machine? You don't think that you should put it in that way? Oh, you told me to put it here. That's how the machine looks like. So you tell the machine, do this, that task will be done. If something again happened, you need again to see the machine that, okay, wait, that happened, you need to react in that way, okay? So um, of course, now that I would say the, the shift is, acting rationally so we need to act but not only um, as a human no with some reason okay we need to have some reasoning to do that so then the AI problem so you need to think what is the problem and then you need to act okay and generally acting the uh, rationally the one that i told you most of the recent ai they use this one okay which is act acting uh, rationally so they try to 
think about solution or think how they do that, and then they will uh, basically act. Now, for the types of AI, um, uh, we categorize the, uh, the AIs based on two things, ability or capability and the functionality. So what is the ability of my AI model, what it can do for me? Now, there are three types based on the ability. We call it narrow AI, which is normal AI. We have a general AI, which is um, excellent AI, I would say. And we have the super AI, which is super excellent, okay? Now we are a narrow AI. Still, we didn't reach the general AI. So we are all the existing ones, even GBT, the other stuff, all of them are narrow AI based, okay? And the other one is based on the functionality, what you want from the machine to do for you. Is it reactive machines? Do you need a limited memory theory of mind, self-awareness? And we will talk about each of them. So going with the first one, which is based on the ability or capability, as I said, we have narrow, we do have a general one, and we have the super. And with, with the stage number one, where we are is the normal one, okay? So you have a problem and you need to solve the problem. And most of the machines, and I would say they can solve one problem, okay? So if you need to solve another problem, you may need to revisit, or you may need to remodel your model, okay? In order to solve that uh, problem. Um, when it comes to the general uh, AI, the general AI or AGI, we need to make the machine like a human. And still we don't have that. So there is some news, they said in USA, they have a robot can feel, can cry, smile, but still that's only the emotions, which is a few of them, right? And what about the others, okay? so. And even they do some testing with that robot, it shows it was really very successful in showing the emotions. I mean, and showing that uh, smiling or crying or even frustrated, disappointed. But again, that's part, and still it's only one part, okay? So we are really still far from that, but they try to do that. Now, the other one where they think about it is the super AI. Super AI, we need to do more than human. So we need to, um, according to some, I think scientists, they said, the mind, what, when we think, we only use, I think about 13% of our power of thinking, only one thing. So think about it if you are able to think in hundred uh, percent. So with 13, you can see we have many inventors, we have many innovative uh, ideas, we have many good things, right? So. That's what they are looking for. They are looking to have really a super AI. Now, the other one is, as I said, in terms of functionality, so reactive AI. So the reactive AI, you try to think about, you have one problem and that's the problem you need to solve. But now when you are talking about building an AI, there are parameters. So the parameters, how many, um, for example, uh, data set you want, how many iterations, what is, let's say, for example, the noise, uh, the number of a -box. So there are many parameters. When the parameters are known, then we use basically the limited, basically, memory. Reactive AI, it's unsupervised, basically. Learning. So you tell the AI, uh, here is the case. If you have that case, just react, and that's it. So you don't train on different types of data. So if that one happened, then the AI will react, okay? So if you look at the picture in here, for example, I have the front dots, and then um, I need to, I ask the AI to do, okay, whenever you have like this, just to draw a diagonal line, and that's what it did, okay? So there is no, no need to train this one, because it's a clear. I have a scenario, as I train, or not a train, I learn the AI what to do. Now, the other one, limit, uh, limited memory, that's what the, most of the researchers they do. You have a data set, you train your model, and then your model will act and behave according to the train uh, or according to the training phase or a training model. Now, the third one is a theory of mind, uh, where uh, basically they mentioned um, this is, will be the next generation of AI. Still, we are not in there. So they are trying to, with a few examples, yeah, we need to learn the AI. So as a human, if we train you, or if we let you to learn about a few things, few concepts, 
Next time, you know what you need to do, right? So you know how to act, you know what you have to do. But with the machines, it doesn't work with the fewer examples. And that's why still we are not there. So if you have a training model and you give a fewer examples and you ask, okay, do something, it doesn't help and it, it doesn't work, okay? Uh, because the results will be not okay. And finally, the self-awareness. So we need uh, machines that even without the training, they understand what they can do and what they can react or they can act. So uh, generally we have, again, also different, as you can see, uh, venues. So a strong AI, um, when we need to build a human-like um, uh, intelligence, we have applied AI. And the applied AI basically is where we are and what we do. So with applied AI, um, we do information processing. You have a lot of information or you try to solve a problem in a smart way. Now, where the AI could be used? Uh, it could be used in different, basically, fields. It could be used in language, linguistic, problem solving, reasoning, learning, uh, perception. So they are different uh, domains. Now, another also parts where you did hear about, and as a researcher, you will hear about it as well. So there are also some fields where we can apply the AI. So machine learning, uh, we have AI when we apply machine learning, neural networks, natural language processing, um, computer vision, linguistics, speech recognition, and there are many of um, applications. So the first one is about the natural language processing. I think you did hear about natural language processing. So the natural language processing, they try to analyze your um, language and it's not necessarily language that you, you speak, no, what you write. So for example, now if you use the Google and you need to search for something, you can find Google can suggest to you something which is related to what you are looking for. How Google he understand that? Because whenever you search in Google, the get that strings or characters that you enter in Google search engine and we will uh, that engine will be trained. So when you access again the engine, they know you based on the strings, based on that, they know what you are looking for and how it looks like, okay? So natural language processing, the history was from 1950 to 1990, as you can see in the slide. Um, uh, so the computer, uh, they were trying to emulate it, the natural language processing by really understanding what are you trying to say. How they did that, they did it based on the predefined rules. So when, for example, he did this, it means that, okay? So they tried to do that. Now, in 1990 to the 2010, they came up with a new thing. They said, okay, why we don't apply machine learning to the natural language of processing? So now we don't need to do brief, predefined rules. How many rules you will predefine? 10, 15, 20? So no, we will apply machine learning. Machine learning, we can have now um, uh, more than, um, let's say, whatever rules, and then it will really try to understand more. Now, in 2010 to this time, 2023, we have natural language processing where we call it neural natural language processing. So they apply deep learning with the natural language processing. And this one has really a strong capability. So, you know, now you can talk to your city or to Alexa or whatever, that's a natural language processing. And nowadays they become smarter than before. Okay, um, another one is about the expert systems. So from the name, uh, you heard about, oh, expert system. What does it mean? Oh, what's the relation of AI with the expert system? Generally, when you know someone is expert in one domain, you go and ask him. So here is the point. So now the AI, we try to build an expert system and that system has a rules and that rules will be used to answer your concern. And how it works is like if then. So if, I, uh, if that machine has been asked that question, then answer that, that answer. If ask you another one, and answer that one. So it's like an if then, when is the first expert system was uh, produced? It was in 1970, 1970. And the other one was in 1980. 
zero in 1982, okay? Um, another one is about robotics. Um, everyone heard about robotics. Robotics is, a, um, I would say, is a science or is a branch, technology branch about robots, uh, more specifically about physical robots. And uh, with the robots, um, we program them to do some tasks for us. So you may program a robot to do, um, uh, for example, saying hi or welcoming the visitors. You may program a robot to help you in home or help you in removing stuff, you can do that. And I'm not sure if you did hear about uh, some robots are now trained by the US uh, military, how they can use the weapons. Okay, so they show one video where the robots, they use the weapons and they were targeting um, a very precise target and they were successfully do that. So, you know, now the robots with the AI becomes really something uh, it can help um, the community, okay? Um, another one is speech recognition. Uh, when we think about, uh, think about speech recognition, you may ask yourself, is it a computer science field? Is it um, a linguistic? Basically, it's in interdisciplinary, okay, subfield of linguistic and the computer science. So what we are trying to do, we are trying to recognize your speech and trans translate it to text, okay? And that's also, nowadays, I think we have some tools they can do that for you. So you took, they translate uh, what you took to something else. And same for the cars, many of the cars, you talk to the car like, okay, I need to call X. Then when they recognize your voice, then they will call X for you. Okay, so again here, we use uh, AI with the um, uh, existing computer science and linguistic uh, technologies. Uh, you can see here on this slide, um, uh, the history of that um, speech recognition. It was in 1784. It has been a long time that people they were thinking about. And the, I would say the main um, stage or where really they start to care about it more it was in 2008. The one in orange, if you can see the mic, where the Google, they were thinking about that, the voice recognition. From that time, they started to move and pay attention more at the speech um, uh, recognition. Now, another one is the computer vision. Um, many of you, of course, went to the airports, uh, many places. They ask you sometimes for face recognition, even for eye uh, recognition. So it has been used in different domains, right? So uh, it could be used, as you can see here in the picture, to detect faces if any crime happened. And uh, we need to know if that guy was bypassed at that time. So we can basically use the AI and detect these images and to know if that person was passed from that uh, place. Now, um, as you can see also, uh, the, also the, uh, they can see, uh, not even that, they can see the body, okay? They can take the points and have, I would say the structure or the gesture for that the human being body, and they can identify or discover who was there. Um, AI also used in machine learning. Many of us, we use uh, machine learning. So with machine learning is basically an application of AI where you have a data set, you give it to a machine learning, extract features, train based on the features, and then predict for you. So if you give, for example, to machine learning, a data set about uh, disease X, and it will be trained, and then you give a test or a target file or unknown case, ask the machine learning, if this case has that disease, then based on the features, they will extract, map with the database, and then it will tell you yes or no. So the machine learning has different domains, uh, unsupervised learning, clustering, where you cluster the similar samples together, or supervised learning, there are many, and also sub of the supervised learning could be um, the regression, which is linear uh, classifiers or normal classifications like uh, SVM decision tree, knife base, there are too many. Or we may have also the reinforcement learning, as you can see, where it has somehow more advanced way uh, of learning. So um, deep learning, that's another also bar. Um, and with the deep learning, um, 
If I ask you a question, why we call it lead learning? Why we use the beat? Yeah, so exactly. So with machine learning, what it, it will happen, you have the data set, you extract features, you train the model based on the features, you have the output. Now with the deep learning, no, you have the neurons, okay, where they, they are different layers. So you give that input and they will, each one gives you a vote. I believe this one is, let's say, disease X. This one, Y. No, this is X. So we have kind of walking that we can have more accurate, uh, uh, like precise answer. Okay. So we call it a deep uh, learning. So here an example. Uh, what is like the difference between the machine learning and deep learning? As you can see, we need a human interpreter. So we need a humans when you use a machine learning. So you have your data set. It's not like you give it to um, a classifier and, hey, I'm going to sleep. The classifier will do the job. No. You need to know what are the features you give to that classifier. And the I would say the most important of uh, the machine learning, the features. So how the features are powerful. If the features are really powerful, then your classifier will be powerful and will be strong. With deep learning, no, we don't need that human intervention. And that's a good news. Because a human, the capability, it will be limited. Um, choosing the feature, if you ask human X, maybe he will see the feature that he chose that's the best. If you go to another one, will say, no, that features Y is the best, and so on. OK? So um, here in the picture where I'm pretty sure you saw in literature, you saw it in internet everywhere. So the AI is the big umbrella. And in that, we do have deep learning, uh, sorry, machine learning, and we do have a deep learning. So with the, with the deep learning, we don't need a human intervention. With the machine learning, we need a human intervention. With the AI, we need the machine to be like a human. So it's not like, uh, like about intervention. No, we need it to be as, as a human, OK? So um, where AI is used? What do you think? Where are AI is used? Everywhere, right? If I ask you, do we use AI in healthcare? Yes. Do we use AI in IT? Yes. Do we use AI in military? Yes. Do, you, uh, do we use AI in communications? Yes. So AI is in everywhere, right? So nowadays, we try to make everything smart, right? To make it really um, available. So, but the question, AI is not in you. AI, according to the history, was in 1956. Why now we think about AI? What do you think? We have a different reasons. Number one, nowadays we have a big data. We don't have this big data as before, right? So if we compare hospitals, 10 years ago, it's not like now. 100 years ago, it's not like now. So when we look at this large, massive data, what we can do with that data? So we didn't know really what we, how we can deal with the data. So we were thinking, OK, let's use AI, deep learning. Another one, computational power. We have a limited, our computer, If we, for example, in security, when you do encryption decryption, you need a you need really a computational power to ca to calculate for you the keys. Now, with the normal one, no, it becomes a problem. So they start to think about why we need really some machines. They help with the more computational power since nowadays the technology is advanced, so we can have that. But long time back, we don't have GPUs. GPUs is like strong uh, storages, right? We don't have. We don't have supercomputers like, like nowadays. Right now, we start to hear about quantum computers. So that's make a reason why we start to look about the AI, better algorithm. When you try to think, you know, maybe you will not be able to have the optimal or the best solution. However, with the AI, yes, it can find a solution for you. Now, the other one is a broad investment. They start to think about the big companies like Facebook, now they use AI. Amazon, they use AI. Intel, they use AI. IBM, they use AI. Why do they use AI? Because they have investment. So they, they use AI 
and then we sell it for clients, customers, and then we get some, uh, basically some money from uh, that. So here are the fields of medical, art, manufacturing, finance, drug manufacturing, military research, marketing. So there are many uh, applications, okay? When it comes to uh, the healthcare or AI for healthcare, there are many domains. Nowadays, we have robots. They assist in doing the surgery, especially with the critical operations or critical surgeries. There are many medical centers. They try to uh, train uh, robots to assist a doctor to do that. Now, another thing is automated image diagnosis. You know, when you go to a hospital and then they ask you to do X-ray or MRI or CT scan, um, you give it to a radiologist and he or she will read it for you and they will drive a report to the doctor. Now, <clears throat> what if we use AI to do that? Analyze it and then try. Maybe using the AI will discover something that maybe the specialist cannot see. We are not seeing here. Maybe the others, they will not like us because it's like we are telling, let's replace everyone with a robot or with the AI. No. We are saying with assisting, I mean, with the technology that we do have also, it, we could have AI help us more and more, okay? To have maybe more accurate and to be more precise. Or it could be also digital consultations. I think nowadays we have chatbots. You go and talk with the chatbot about the medications. Okay, so I have these symptoms. And then based on that, they will get back to you with some advices or they will ask you to go and see a doctor or do something. <clears throat> Another thing was used during the pandemic, COVID, is about the drug discovery, about clinical um, uh, trust, about uh, clinical um, uh, trials, AI was there. And they helped the researchers, the doctors, to find really a real drug. So another also way um, in uh, security, and the surveillance systems. Um, we always have a cameras and that cameras are controlled by some software. When we use the AI, they detect if there is any suspicious thing, they can send a message or they can send alarm to the security guard or to someone, hey, there is something suspicious. And that's very also useful. Um, another one in forensics, you know, nowadays when the crime happened, we have many evidences, how we could start from where and how we can really get the most beneficial model or approach to analyze them. Nowadays, researchers, they start to work heavily on applying AI on forensic domain. And the reason they want really to uh, facilitate the things uh, easier and faster, okay? Another one, of course, with cyber security, uh, AI is used in different domains, malware detection, intrusion detection in different domains. So it's used. Um, another also application is multimedia. Sometimes you have a picture, you need to modify the picture. You have some videos, audios, you need to work on them. Now, nowadays, we start to hear about metaverse. So choosing avatar, going, doing shopping, many things. That's also nowadays we start to think about how we use AI to make the metaverse more really convenient to users. So um, <coughs> TV, gaming, 3D, so there are really many ways where you can use uh, basically the AI. So uh, another way also with the business analytics, um, so when you hire uh, someone, when you do market prediction, when you, for example, try to take a, a decision, decisions, you need to analyze what do you have all of these, we can uh, do them by the AI. So um, another one also for manufacturing, as you can see here, in 1784, we have industry 1.0. And now, you know, we have industry 4.0. Nowadays, it's the revolution, is industry 4.0, where we do have robots or robotics with the AI. And also we have um, many things related to the operation research. Nowadays, many researchers, they use AI to improve uh, the quality, to do the inspection for the products, 
do, uh, do more research on the operational uh, research. There is even one field in industrial engineering about the operational uh, field or operational uh, research. So um, another more about controlling the quality, you know, we have quality assurance, uh, supply chain resources. So there are many ways and many applications we can use. Another way it's about the autonomous vehicles, uh, drones, even autonomous uh, vehicles, pilots. There are many ways or many applications we can use it. We can use it even for different applications, transportation, self-driving cars, and etc. So um, delivery, maybe nowadays we heard about Amazon, they start to use the drones, autonomous uh, small cars for delivery. They train that one and now they use it in some areas in USA. And that's what they, were, they are thinking about to use it. And AI also is used in aviation uh, on the airports, aviation systems. We use also the AI, military. Military is used in uh, weapon, uh, rescue, used in swarm intelligence, where you have a different military aircraft when they try to attack some place or something, they are also a monitor controlled by the AIs. So if you think you, we are missing any of the applications, you can just write it on the chat that we know that there are really other applications that we can have. Uh, one of the examples, how I can use AI. Now, one of the most common examples where I recommend you, if you have no background, if you don't have any knowledge about using AI, start with this, this example. If you search on the internet, you can find many resources about this one. So let's say we have a problem and there's a problem I need really to know what is written on an image, handwritten number. So for example, you may write number one, number two, three, four, five. So I need to train a deep learning model and ask the deep learning model, okay, could you tell me what is the number of this? I give an image and then based on the training, it will tell me this is number one or number two. Now the problem with the deep learning, we need a huge data set. So if you have a list uh, data set, you cannot use a deep learning. Most of probably the accuracy will be very low. Now the question that always students ask, what programming language you advise us to use for deep learning? What has been used on the literature by the researchers? Number one, Python. So the most recommended tool to be used is Python. So Python, why is Python? It has all the packages that you need for the deep learning. And it's easy to learn. And as I said, it has all the packages. The other language they use is Java. Java also is a good one. But Java, they did mention you can use it for expert systems, answering machines. If you need to have answering model machine, they recommend you to use Java. It has a powerful, uh, powerful um, packages in that domain. Another one you can use also, so the Python, Java, you can use also C++. So it has been used on the past. And um, and many others, uh, wherever you feel you are comfortable are, I forget one of the most important, honestly, languages are. And the good in R, many of the non-computer science students, they like R because R is like a human uh, programming language. So it, it's like when you write a code, it's like you write a script um, at high level, okay? So many students, they like to use R uh, language. If I need to, you, uh, to ask you a question, when AI has been invented, and let's say in, in 1956, or I would say in 1961, what the programming languages was used? Do you know? No. So then the language that they use is LISP, L-I-S-P. That's the AI language. John McCarthy, when he defined the AI, and he coined the AI, he used that one uh, for AI. And then the new uh, programming languages like Java, Python, they start to take the features and improve that one. But the original one was uh, was by 
uh, invented or I would say used by uh, Joe McCarthy, which is the father of the AI. So when I have a data set, let's say you are a student, master, PhD, researcher, and you need to use a deep learning. The first question you need to ask yourself, what is the size of your data set? Is it a huge? If yes, then think about the data set. I mean about, sorry, the deep learning. Now, if not, think about machine learning. Because with machine learning, you intervene. A human will try to extract features. So if you have only, let's say, 1,000, uh, less than 10,000, let's say, files, I can use machine learning, OK? Now, with this, this data set, which called uh, uh, main set data set, it has 70,000 files, 60,000 for training. I'm talking about images, 10,000 for testing. OK, now I have a data set. The size of the data set is a huge, is a big one. Then, yes, I need deep learning. Now, the other question, how I will train? Do I use all the data as a training? And what's about testing? So generally, you need to divide or split your data set. So you split, let's say, 90% training, 10% for testing. And then you do iterations. That's another parameter. How many iterations you need to do? Now, you may ask me, which one is recommended? Now, if you have a strong power, computation power, you are using a server, then number of iterations should be high, let's say 10, 15 times. But if you are using your laptop, maybe three times will be enough, okay? Having more iterations, you may have more good, uh, good results, okay? But again, limited resources does make our uh, problem difficult to do that uh, resources. So again, you need to split the data set, training, and also um, uh, uh, testing. Do I need to do it manually? No. With deep learning, you don't need to do that. With deep learning, you just put the percentage, the ratio. I need to make it 90 to 10. So 90% training, 10% testing, and then it, you will see the results. So the uh, results will at least give you an indication how, model, uh, how your model is, uh, works. One of the questions always they ask us, which one I can use? Many deep learning models we do have. CNN, uh, neural network, and ML. Do I use MLP? Uh, which one I have to use? Do you have an answer? Well, yes, what is the image and it's a CNN. Okay, okay, that's a good point. So here, one of your colleagues did say that if you have a data set like images, computer vision, you see CNN. So generally, what, which one the best to use is based on the recommendation that we do have. In addition, how the method it works. Like CNN, why is good for computer vision? Because of sequential things, okay? That's why it's good for that. So generally, you need to read the description. You need to know what the data set is, uh, details of your object or of your data set file, then you know which one you need to use. So here, since I have images, I need then to use CNN. I can use it. Still, can I use other deep learning model? Yes, not necessarily CNN. But CNN approved is the best for the computer vision, OK, or the images. Now you need a Python. So if you don't have Python, you can easily download the Python. There is something called uh, Jupyter Notebook. It's like editor, where you can write your Python, you can compile it, run it, and see the results, okay? And I would recommend you to use this uh, Jupyter Notebook. It's free, you can find it. And finally, uh, you need a package called ByTorch. So, you know, I, I'm not sure how, how many of you are familiar with writing Python. When you write a Python code, you need to import some packages. So at the beginning, you do import, then by torch, then you have this one, okay, this package. So when you use some parameters for CNN, let's say, uh, what is the mapping size? What is the number of traces, whatever, they will be recognized by the Python, okay? What I'm going to do, I'm going to share um, uh, my script with uh, the coordinator of this workshop, and I will ask her to share it with every one of you. You can run it, okay? You don't need to download the data set. The, the script itself, download the data set for you, run it, and show you the results. 
I would recommend you to play with the parameters and then you will understand what it, what it will happen. Okay, and I will be talking about the parameter. Here is the picture. So if I need to go to that one, so I have an image. That image has a number inside. Let's say here three, and then I give it to deep learning. Deep learning has many levels. And CNN, it should have a, a di dimensions. Like is it two by two layers, three by three? If you are using in your laptop or in your desktop computer, I recommend you try to use two by two. Okay, and see how it looks like. So when you use that, as you can see, the, uh, the CNN, what it does, when you have that image, they take a segment of your image. And that segment could be a square, could be any shape, any mark. But most common in deep learning, they take a square. So that squares, it will be an input to the neurons that I have in my, in my model. Then what it will happen, they will be trained based on this one. Um, now, once they are trained, they know number one, how it looks like, number two, how it looks like, when you give a target, they will come back. And if you look at the picture at the end, we have fully connected where it gives you a vote. Zero, one, to nine. Now, if I have one neuron, it gives me one. One means I match three. The others give me zeros. This is a clear is number three. Okay? So if some of them they give me no three, that one give me five, then they go with the majority one. And that's why, yes, sometimes we have a false positives, okay? So you need to think about what I need to play with the parameters. Now, how I can play with the parameters and why the deep learning is good? That's a very good question, basically. Now, with the deep learning, is a deep learning. So when you train the, the deep learning, they try to keep different types of option segments. And the best, one, it would be considered. That's how I can detect the three and one. And the good news with deep learning, it add noise to your images. That's why deep learning is more powerful because even if you give an image and say, hey, this is a three, then inside the a neural network, let's say, I think they call it polling max, where you add some, or drop out, where you add some noise to that image. And then the deep learning is trained not only pure image, even if there are some image which has some um, uh, noises or something still deep learning can recognize. How based on the training? When the training, there are many parameters, you play with the parameters and then it will train the model. Now you may think about, so it means we may have, we can have a perfect model, yes. But do you have a super computational resources? That's the question. Most of us don't have then it will be a problem. If we do have, hopefully when we have a, co a quantum computers are soon available, we can use them, most of uh, probably we will have a perfect uh, uh, deep learning models, okay? We can train them, we can play with the parameters, and then we will be able to have a very strong model candidate, okay? So um, now we did hear about chat GPT. And there are other even AI tools. So today we need really to understand how it works that chat GPT and why the AI is used and what are the other AI tools. Now, coming to the chat GPT, um, you know it comes from GPT. So there is a G is for something, T for something, T for something. So the G, as you can see in the slide, generated. So they try to predict what is the next one. And the P is a pre-trained. So previously you trained that one in large documents and we will see how many, okay? And three transformer, encoder, decoder, based on your net. Here it comes the deep learning, okay? Because how it works, when you have features, we have uh, autocoder and encoder, okay? So here is, I will say the series of that GBT. So we do have GBT one, where it was trained on book data, five gigabytes. Now, GBT2, it was trained in 40 GBT, uh, gigabytes. Now, GBT3, 600 gigabytes. GBT3.5, uh, we have more than 175 billion tokens. Okay, tokens is like a parameters trained on a massive data set. 
And we have GPT-4, which is 500 times GPT-3. My question, nowadays, the GPT that we do have is which one? Is it 3, 3.5, or 4? Yeah. Nowadays, the open AI, they release GPT, right? Is which one? Is it 3, 3.5, or 4? Is it 3.5? And now they are looking for GPT-4. So GBT 3.5 is really something massive and huge. That's why it makes everyone now talks about it. How it works, look at this, here is the picture. It has two main stages, the GBT. The first one, training. The other one, answering a question, where you use the GBT. Now with the training, um, as you can see, so it starts basically with the stage number one, which is a, a pre-training. So pre-training, you try to train that GBT. If I have two plus two, this, it will be completed as two plus two equal four. So welcome to, so they train many and large and massive sentences. Okay, that's the pre -train. How to complete the sentences, okay? Now, uh, the second one, and this one was based on the 300 million tokens, which is a lot of numbers. Best number two, find a train. Now, once we do brief training, how we can continue the sentences. By the way, why do you think we train the GBT how to connect the sentences? What is the benefit? What is the goal of the pre training? The pre training, you train the GBT grammatical things, how we connect sentences. That's how the GBT, when they answer your question is follow the grammatical things, okay? So how we do that pre-train? Now, once he learns, that's the goal. Pre-training, just teach or learn. GBT, how the grammar, uh, grammar uh, or the grammars could be used, okay? Now, stage number two, find a training, where now you try to have a data and you train on text, articles, book, many things. So for example, let's say I need to know about scientific infection. Now the GBT reads hundreds, millions, thousands of articles, book about this one. When you ask about scientific infection, it will be very easy to generate that for you. Train, know the knowledge is there, grammatical already have it in a pre-trained, they can answer it. Now, when you go to second phase on the down, we're answering uh, uh, when you write something, they check first. Is it ethical what you are asking? If no, it will show you, I'm so sorry. For example, here, sorry, I'm not trained to provide you medical advice. So for example, uh, you can ask GBT, hey GBT, um, a person uh, has a headache, which medicine I can take? It, it might tell you, there is a tendency. That's why here, if you look at this picture, if it's not ethical, hey, go to the template response generation, and then it will be generated for you. Like for me, yesterday, I asked GBT, uh, what's your name? He said, my name, Abdullah. And then you are from where? They said, from UK. So you say, start, what is your own? 39, I think. So you say, I mean, it trained and tried to give you something, but again, it tried to see that if that really makes sense, there is no ethical things there, then it will answer you. And then when you ask, hey, could you give me more answer? That's the stage. Yes, it can give you more answer. Hey, it's not correct. Could you please correct your answer? Then they will modify, but they will check. When you ask for that, is this still you are ethical? Yes, there is nothing about some abusing or something, then they will modify the answer. That's why when you ask the GTB, question different times you will have different answers okay now what we can do solving coding problems it can write a code for you many of the uh, people nowadays they ask to write a program um writing blogs um developing applications informations answers so uh, how you can do that or how you can use it you visit openai.com create an account once you create an account, you will be able to access and having basically 
uh, answering or do whatever. Or if you like to have it for Python, if you write a Python, you just install the Open AR. Then you will have the GTB with the Python things, okay, as a plugin, which is really good. Now, I would like to talk about other tools. I'm not sure if you did hear about these tools or not. There is one tool where it's called uh, boys.com. Um, uh, and this boys tool is AI uh, power tool. It learn you how to be confident. Many of us students, even humans, they don't feel comfortable when they have a talk or when they talk in a video or voice. So this one, you just record yourself and upload it. They will analyze it and give you uh, advice. It's a very nice tool. So you try to do it and you will see where you have problems, limitations, and can help you really to, um, uh, to improve yourself. So another one is called Train. Um, and this one, train.fm, is about the music. And it helps you to work, sleep, productivity, and mental health better. So in this one, you can mention for this one, they use, of course, the AI, I'm sleeping. Then they will choose some music. It will help you to sleep. And try this one. You will see it's very useful, okay? As a free, you can, uh, you can have it. Uh, another tool, and um, that tool called um, uh, the Magic Eraser. This is a very nice one. If you have a picture and you need to re remove a part of the picture, you can simply just give this picture to the tool and click on the part you need to remove, and then the part will be removed. That's it. Just by clicking. It's very easy, and you can use it. Another tool called beautiful.ai. Uh, this is a best presentation software for students. Many times, if you need to prepare slides, you really don't know how you need to prepare that. What is the best template? So the good things with this, AI, they use AI to generate a template for you. So you put your, uh, for example, um, uh, you stay on the brand, you have many things, you have a good template, very well-designed one, where you can easily find and have. Another one also, it's called video. And this video, uh, you can make short videos from long video. So let's say sometimes you have a video which is, let's say, 20 minutes, and you need only a short video from this one. This AI one, it can make short video from this long video. And again, this one is a free, um, free one, uh, free tool. Now, the last one that I would like to talk uh, about last part is about the challenges and the future. What is the future and what are the challenges? Now, for challenges, we have five main challenges, uh, lack of expertise, computing power, trust, privacy, security. Now, starting talking about the first one, lack of expertise, um, you may think, oh, wait, how we lack expertise? The problem, all the, I mean, all the individuals that we know, they work in AI, they are honestly not professional in AI. They are just manipulator. They know how to use the AI. They know how to apply it on many applications. But when I say professional, we mean people have the skills to improve, change the algorithm itself, which is, that's very rare, okay? Another one, computing power. We need really strong machines. Now you may tell me, wait, you are making the things hard. We need to use it, but we need machines. Yeah, but what we can do? If you have a huge mass of data, like a big data or something, we need really machines to train uh, and to give us some indications about that data. So that's why, yes, we need to think about supercomputers, quantum nowadays, hopefully soon we will have it, then it will make the life easier. One thing which is uh, somehow drawback or a negative, if you train single deep learning model, not multiple, only single, Okay, and this one can generate up to 600,000 pounds of CO, CO2 images. And that's a huge number. And you know, like, I'm not sure if you are aware uh, of the cryptocurrency, some guys who did mining for cryptocurrency, they keep the machine running for days. 
So the power consumption, the image and it's also huge. So that's also one of the drawback negative. For a trust, um, there is really very important for trust. How you can trust AI? Let's say you are a doctor and someone came to you and said, I introduced to you a robot Alex. He will help you to do the operation. You will say the first sentence, this is a machine and I'm, I cannot trust, right? You are a patient. You go to, um, uh, let's say, to hospital. You saw a doctor, and then the doctor asked the robot to check you. Oh, are you crazy? I mean, how, how are you making the robot to check? How, you know, that trust, another also problem with the trust. Could you have all the data set? For example, I did a study, and I say, the male in UAU, for example, let's say they are lazy, for example. How you know that? Have you tested all the mail? How, do you have a data set access into all of them? So that's really something that you need to think it wise when you talk about the trust, okay? Another one is about the privacy challenges. You are using a huge data set, like data set from hospital, big data, from governments. We may have sensitive data, Facebook, Facebook, they have a huge data set about us. What if that data set was disclosed or someone was able to access that data set? Then forget it, the privacy is not there anymore, right? And another way about adversary models. Again, bad guys are there. If you are trying to have a good model, still we have a problem. What is the problem? They are adversary model. Adversary, what they do? I give you an example in security. When I have a model, this model can tell me this program good or bad. Now the bad guys, they, they can fold that deep learning model and tell me about the good software or the bad software, they are good software. And then I will use them. And I think one story happened in two years ago in USA, in Boston, in one of the largest hospital, they found one software used AI to analyze MRI images for cancer detection, for cancer detection can be deceived. That's very dangerous. Think about if someone go to a doctor, take that image and tell the patient you have nothing, but in fact has a problem. So then that he, will, he or she will get worse and that's what really affects. So the adversary models are there. Researchers now are working on that. They try to attack existing models and then find a solution how you can protect uh, the models. Now, future, we are thinking about deep reasoning, how we can make the machine thinking as a human and reasoning as human. That's really one of the future that we are thinking about. What's about federated learning, where we ensure that uh, basically the privacy. And nowadays, many of the guys, they use the federated learning, which is part of the AI, okay? How you can preserve the data, or I would say preserve the privacy of the data. Quantum computing AI chips, so hopefully we will have speed and faster and better chips uh, and also better also algorithms, hopefully soon. And that's the good thing I need to talk to you as a researcher. The problem with AI or machine learning is a black box. You just tell me, according to my deep learning, that's the output. Nowadays, we need to open that box where we call it explainable learning. Don't tell me he has a disease. Tell me why he has the disease. Now, if you have a plan to apply the AI, you can think about the explainable. It's a very recent topic. We don't have much people done a good job in this domain. For sure, it will be one of the first attempts in your domain in this bar. And finally, do you think we will reach to this stage soon? You go for an interview, you were sitting behind your colleagues and one robot was sitting also. And when the manager come out, and the manager was a robot and he asked the robot to join the company. And then you will leave and you don't have a job. What do you think? Do you think we will reach? Yes. In Amazon, yes. some warehouses. They are, they are like uh, little robots and 
they have to prioritize the people. Yes, yeah. So, for example, there are some warehouses in USA, we use robots inside. So, we search for the package, we brought it, we put it here and there. So, when you look at it, just the human are controllers, few of them, and the remaining, they are basically uh, robots. Okay. So, thank you so much for listening, and thanks for the one who joined online. If you have any questions, you can ask me. I will just check the chat messages if anyone has a question. Um, I think, okay, in any, okay, I think no more questions, but in any case, if you have any questions, not about the workshop, about your, um, uh, about your research, about your using AI in your research, feel free to ask me. You can send me an email, okay? You can um, even visit my office. I'm in E1 building. I would really be very happy to help. Thank you so much for listening. I wish you a nice night and uh, hopefully see you in another workshop. Thank you so much.